This week on the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. We are rejoined with the awesome Eric Bischoff as we conclude our interview for 2021. In part two with Eric Bischoff, we'll be discovering Eric's thoughts on the fall of WCW, the British Bulldog accident, the battles that many substance dependers wrestlers face, losing WCW to WWE, and the final days and fall of WCW. Told like never before, only here on the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and welcome to the show that inspires you, motivates you, and educates you in your journey in finding balance in day-to-day life. My guest today is an author. He has been the vice president and president of a major sports entertainment company. He revolutionized his particular industry and niche and became one of the most controversial people and persons, rightly or wrongly, um, in history of his niche. He is the author of the, the book that I'm reading at the moment, Controversy Creates Cash. He's got his own podcast and is the star of it called H3 Weeks and I am delighted to bring on and chat with the amazing Eric Bischoff. Eric welcome to the show my friend how are you doing today? I'm doing very well John and thank you for the invite I was, I've been looking forward to this. This episode will now continue from where we left off if you haven't seen last week's episode we encourage you to go and watch part one with Eric Bischoff and then come back to watch part two enjoy the show. Correct. And, and I find it interesting as well that, you know, that the phrase that you use, that they looked at you, again, I'm paraphrasing, but almost like you had two heads. And it strikes me as, oh, my goodness, this guy is actually serious, which in my mind, at least, leads me to think, well, were they not serious and not looking at this stuff before you came in? Um, and that's, you know, that concerns me. And, and I use that um, phrase that you used, which was, let's look and see where we can cut costs in 2017 with my art business because the world was changing, Facebook and social media was changing. Um, It was nearly a a fatal year for so many businesses and we did the exact same thing where I was like, okay, if we've got brochures that are lying around, let's get them out, let's at least do something with them. And that was all stemming from your advice that came through there. So that's, you know, that's an amazing thing itself. 95, go on Eric. No, I was gonna say what's interesting is, you know, you look at where we are in 2020, Mm -hmm television is changing oh yeah you know rapidly because of streaming obviously travel has changed because so many things have changed because of 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 COVID-19 that you know those who are able to embrace the idea of adapting yeah and changing in order to stay ahead of the curve will continue to prosper absolutely people who resist that change and resist adaptation hoping things will get back to normal are going to fail. Yeah. And it's really interesting, you know, back when, you know, you mentioned, weren't they even thinking about it? And the answer was no, no, everybody in WCW was very comfortable with the way things were, believe it or not. <laughs> Nobody, people don't like to change. If, if, if I would have been elected president a couple of weeks ago, God forbid, <laughs> and I would have stood up and said, okay, my first day in office, I'm going to sign an executive order that requires everybody in the United States of America to put their left sock on before they put their right sock on. People would go nuts because some people like to put their right sock on first. And the idea of having to change a habit, people resist it, even if the habits are bad or even if the habits don't really matter. 
the idea that people have to change anything more, more than often, more often than not, people resist that change, yeah. even if it's better for them. It's just human nature. It, it is. So and, and, then, and that's I think the reason that the, the, no, I was say, I think the reason that people looked at me like I had two heads is because I was asking them to change yeah. their daily habits and nobody wanted to do that. And it's a direct quote from Darwin, what you, you speak about there. Um, you know, it, it's the ones that are most responsive to change that are actually going to, like you say, go on and prosper. And it's not the strongest of the species. But moving forward, obviously, you know, Ted's mightily impressed at this point. We're referring again to Ted Turner. Uh, mightily impressed with how you're doing and how WCW is growing and everything there. You get an amazing opportunity. And we, I love this point in particular because it, it's the whole thing of success breeds success. You end up going up for a meeting with Ted Turner. He sit, you, you sit down and have this conversation, I'm sure feeling pretty good. And Ted turns to you and says, Eric, <laughs> what do we need to do? Because obviously Vince and, uh, Vince and Ted had had a, a long standing history. What do we need to do to compete with Vince McMahon? And that's a big thing. You're talking again, the top line, the king of the castle, everything that's there. Let's play a game called freeze frame. We do this with a lot of our guests. What went through your head at that point when he's saying to you, what do we got to do, Eric? Is language an issue on your show? <laughs> no, go for it. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it's the first thing I thought of. Because, you know, I wasn't, you know, I went in, you're, you're right. I, I was my first real official meeting with Ted Turner. Oh, wow. I had had, you know, group corporate meetings with Ted and, you know, Christmas parties and things like that, but never a formal presentation to Ted Turner. And this was the first time. And I, the, the, I called the meeting or I asked for the meeting. Okay. I didn't call for the meeting. I asked for the meeting. Big difference. But I asked for the meeting because I wanted to do a pretty big deal for an international uh, placement of WCW in uh, China. Yes. There was a, a, a new network in China called Star TV, which was owned by Rupert Murdoch. Okay. And anybody that knows anything about Rupert Murdoch and Ted Turner, if you go back into the mid nineties, they were the Vince McMahon, mm -hmm. Eric Bischoff. That was, that was the cable war. Ted couldn't stand Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch couldn't stand <laughs> Ted Turner. They were mortal corporate enemies. And I wanted to go do a deal with an affiliate of Rupert Murdoch's mm -hmm. Fox Broadcasting in China. And I knew that if I just went and did it, I could have done that. I could have signed because I was authorized to sign any document up as long as it didn't exceed a million dollars. Okay. So I, I could have signed it on my own, but I thought, no, that's not going to be good. So I wanted to get Ted's blessing. And I had done all my research. I had a great presentation, PowerPoint. I had all my facts. I had everything. I'm a good salesman. When I want to sell something, I'm going to, it's going to get sold nine times out of 10. So I was feeling really confident. I got about three minutes into my pitch and Ted shut me down and asked me the question that you asked. Wow. And in my head, I was like, yeah. And I, I you know, I kind of went back to my days in martial arts. Mm -hmm. I, I also did some Golden Gloves boxing too while I was doing martial arts. And the first thing, you know, that I learned when you get hit really hard and you know you're going to need a bit yeah. to get your wits back is to tuck your chin and cover and just look down over the tops of your eyes and try not to get hit again until you get your wits about you. And in my head, I was like, oh, now what am I going to do? Because I hadn't thought about that. I had never thought about competing. All I thought about was making $1 in profit. That was my goal. Wow. I believe that if I was the first person to ever turn even a single dollar of profit in WCW, that my career path would be paved with gold. Absolutely. So the only thing I was focused, I was obsessed, I was beyond obsessed, was making one dollar a profit and the deal that i wanted to do in china would have taken us way beyond that so that's all i wanted and when ted kind of pulled the rug out from underneath me and asked me about competing with wwf i didn't know how to answer him yeah because i'd never given that any thought that was not on my that was not on my it was not a conscious thought in my ever 
even in my dreams, I didn't think about that. And I didn't, I figured, well, if I'm, if, if I try to bullshit Ted Turner, I'm toast. So I thought, what can I possibly say? So I said, well, I'm just going to tell him the truth. Monday Night Raw mm -hmm. is on Monday nights in prime time. Our number one show is on Saturday afternoon. They have prime time and we don't. That's the real answer. Yeah. And it was honest. I, I did, And I didn't think he'd, I, I thought, well, he'd go, oh, okay, well, that's a good answer. And then we could move on. But he didn't. <laughs> He looked over at a guy by the name of Scott Sass, who was really Ted Turner's right hand at the time. He looked over at Scott Sass and said, Scott, give Eric two hours every night on Monday night on TNT. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> I didn't want that. I didn't know how to do that. I hadn't even thought about it. But that was the end of the meeting. Whoa. I walked out of that. I walked into that meeting hoping to get permission to sign a contract that would generate about almost a million dollars a year in revenue. And I didn't get that, but I got two hours on prime time on the number one network in Turner Broadcasting. So yeah, it was a, it was a shock. And and obviously then you've got to, you know, process that. Obviously you go back to, you, you know, to, to Laurie and to family and say, um, honey, uh, well, that didn't work out, but Ted's come up with this other idea. And you wonder how long Ted had been sort of mulling this over in his mind for before he comes to, to you and says it. But 95 from the, I didn't actually realize um, that 95 was such a massive year for, for you personally, professionally, but also for the company. You, you know, September, what was it? September 4th, uh, you, you launched Monday Nitro. At this point, you've got, you know, you, there's so much that's going on. But one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about as well was the, because I don't think you, you've spoken about this too much, was about taking WCW into, was it North Korea, if I've got that correct? Yeah, that happened. I think that did happen in 95. Okay. Yeah, it did. Um, I was working pretty closely with New Japan Pro Wrestling at the time. Uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling was the number one wrestling promotion in Japan. Wrestling has always been, well, not always, but for a long time has been very, very popular in Japan, mm -hmm. much like it is here in the United States. And I was working with the executives uh, in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And one of them was a gentleman by the name of Antonio Inoki. Mm -hmm. He was the president of, of New Japan. He was also a Japanese politician. He was oh, a wow. member of the Japanese Diet, which is very similar to the United States Senate, mm -hmm. um, probably similar to Parliament in the UK. And he was, uh, he asked me, he knew I had a relationship with Muhammad Ali. And he asked me if I would be willing to bring a group of wrestlers over to Pyongyang, North Korea, for an event called a International Peace Festival. Okay. And it would be members of New Japan Pro Wrestling versus members of WCW. And Muhammad Ali would be kind of the host, if you will. Wow. So I contacted Muhammad Ali and, and he was very excited about doing it and we did it. That's, I mean, that's amazing. You know, from, from you know, where we were just were a few minutes ago with WCW being a this broken toy to all of a sudden going to, you know, North Korea, which is a place that most people did not go and, and uh, you know, get into. What was going through your mind as you're walking through, you know, could you call it customs over there? Because I know that they took the passports from you guys. What was going through your head at that point when you were over there? Um, you know, it was, it's hard to explain it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know what it's like to, you know, be the fan on the moon or to be <laughs> in an environment that no one else had ever been in before. Yeah. But I had never met anybody that had been in North Korea. I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain it. You know, it's such a, it's another world. Yeah, it's, oh, definitely. In every way that I was stunned. You know, I, look, one of the reasons I went there, I went there for a couple of reasons. Some of them were actually business reasons, but for the most part, to be really honest about it, I've always been fascinated with other cultures. Mm -hmm. I've always, you know, I, 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 as a young kid, you know, born in the 50s, grade school in the 60s, during the Cold War, um, I was always fascinated with the Soviet Union and, the, the, you know, Russia 
as a country, the Soviet Union, when it was the Soviet Union. Communism to me was, you know, I was always curious if it was as horrible as the uh -huh. teachers in school made it out to be, you know, because even at a young age, I, I always knew there was, there's always two sides to a coin. Of course. You know? and, and we never, I never got to experience that other side. The Soviet Union fell um, before I got a chance to go over there and experience it. And going to North Korea was as close as I could get. So I was fascinated with the opportunity to really see what the culture was like. And I had a very, very open mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tend to be pretty open-minded anyway to other cultures yeah. and things. I, I find them fascinating. Um, but even with the open mind that I had, I was shocked mm -hmm. at the living conditions in just the living conditions in general in North Korea were right. shocking to me. Wow. Wow. And, and again, you know, and again, like, like yourself, you know, I love other cultures and other uh, traditions. And I know when I moved up to Scotland, you know, 10 years ago, and, and I moved up here close to Burns night and the ha eating haggis and the singing, the dancing and doing Kayleys and this, to me, you know, this guy from uh, the West Midlands in, in Huddersfield, it was just completely alien and like, oh, okay, what on earth's going on? Um, but like you say, isn't I mean, it, it awesome though? It, oh, it's amazing. It, isn't it just, I mean, just hearing you describe that makes me want to come visit. Well, well, Laurie had said that Scotland would, was one of her places that she always wanted to come. So if you guys ever make it over here, you, you've got a place to stay, um, because you'll absolutely love it, especially up into the Highlands as well, where in a few years we're looking at moving to. Um, but I remember coming over to the United States for the first time and I was in Nebraska and, you know, things are moving so quick compared to here and the pace of life is much quicker. And they, you know, they, they were saying to me, it's like, uh, if you think this is fast, you want to go to New York. And I found when I went to Maryland, and I went to Colorado, the pace of life was much quicker. And, and you know, but, but like you said, it's fascinating. I absolutely love history before um, we, we got into this. We're actually filming a, a show called Out Through the Ages which you know, looked at Victorian history and, and there was 10 seasons all lined up with history throughout the ages, but that's uh, an, another story for another time. Um, but obviously you were looking at this point of what can I do, you know, because in your own words, you knew you couldn't compete with Vince um, from certain aspects, but you could be different. And that's, that's one of the amazing things you could say, okay, well, their characters are kind of cartoonish and animated. I'm gonna make mine very, very real. You know, their storylines are more animated and cheesy, appealing to kids. I'm going to appeal to, you know, a male demographic of what was it, 18 to 34, if I've got that correct. Um, 18 to 39. 18 to 39. I was close. I was close. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, 95 in particular is a really big year for you. Like I say, you launched Monday Nitro, which would be your flagship show um, in the Mall of America, which is, you know, at that point, humongous. Uh, and, and business, what's going through your head on September 4th, 1995, when you're launching this show, you're sitting there and you're thinking, we've actually done this. Was it the sense of excitement or was it the next logical step? And it was just business as usual. No, it was excitement. It, it was pure adre adrenaline. You know, I knew that I had the confidence of Ted Turner behind me. Yeah. So, so I, I, fear of failure is probably something that I deal with more now okay. as I've gotten older uh -huh. and more experienced. But when I was 40 years old in 1995, I had no fear of failure. Wow. There was just none. So it was just nothing but excitement. It's fantastic. And, and fear of failure is something that I experience in, in doing this show. And it, it, I, I honestly, I could probably be the most successful person on the planet and still be fearful of failing because of my own experience and, and things. And that's, you know, it's a whole journey you've got to work through. Um, we, we walk through, obviously, some of the things that now start to take off for, for WCW, uh, a lot more nitros. We, we mentioned you have a flagship show. You've also got things that, it, that would eventually lead and revolutionize other aspects of wrestling. The power plant, which was an early version of what you could call NXT, uh, which is basically a training facility for aspiring wrestlers. Through there, you obviously had uh, Goldberg, which was in, what, 98, the biggest star probably. Um, 
that, that you guys had and the, the meteoric rise that you guys had with him. But also you had the giant uh, Paul White in, in, in the big show, uh, which is a guest that we would love to have on this show because picking his brain would be fantastic. But it was amazing to see how it all revolutionized and all grew. Talk to us, obviously from 95 to, if we say 98 was, I think that the real on fire period Obviously, you've got the NWO, which is a new world order, um, and that was a major movement. But talk to us about the success and your kind of mindset and if and how it changed you during this time. Do you, your son or daughter, struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach to the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Unlike a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step-by-step -step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening and I love to listen to people, their stories, their, their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire or they get that goal or they hit that big target or whatever it might be. And also, as the trifecta, I'm committed to you, to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed, if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the early bird special offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, oh, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one. Understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people, and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch. Let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other. And I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day folks take care god bless and i will see you soon uh you know things happen so fast yeah. you know we went from september of 1995 you know hoping that we could be competitive uh -huh. with wwf we established ourselves very early on as not only competitive but we were beating them on a regular basis even before the nwo happened wow by July of 96, when the NWO became a reality, we ran away with it. Yeah. And oh, yeah. The growth was so fast and, and, and so large. You know, the, the, it's hard to really explain. Uh -huh. We went from, as I said earlier, a company that was, had gross revenues of $25 million a year and losing $10 million in 1992 two or three by 1996 we were generating 200 million dollars a wow. year and profiting in the neighborhood of about 35 or 40 million that's incredible from a corporate from a corporate point of view that's drastic growth yeah. 
Oh, it's yeah. not incremental growth. It's not, it, it, it's not admirable growth. It's unbelievable Major. growth. Yeah, yeah. And I wished, you know, people ask me all the time, do you, well, do you have any regrets? Mm -hmm. And I really have none. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, today, to you today if it weren't for the sum total of all of the good and all of the bad, you know, that's been a part of my career. And I, that's the way I look at things. But if I have one thing that I wished someone smarter or older and more experienced than me at the time would have pulled me aside and said, I wished I would have appreciated it more yeah. in the moment that it was all happening because, because it was happening so fast. That's not an excuse. Yeah. But because I was inexperienced, because I was young, because I was so aggressive, because I was such an entrepreneur, because I was so focused by that time on being the number one wrestling company in the world, because now I believed I could yeah. be. Yeah. Um, and it was important to me. At that point, I just, I had blinders on. Yeah. I wasn't taking a minute to appreciate it. I wasn't, I was just going, I was like, okay, what do we do tomorrow? You know, what do we do next? What are we going to do after lunch? I never stopped and went, wow, this is pretty cool. This is pretty awesome. I did never did that. It was just, I can't explain it. it it's I, I kind of like, you know, yeah. you're being, you're in a forest and your job is to cut down trees and all you keep doing <laughs> cut down trees and going, okay, where's the next tree? I'm going to cut that one down. I'm going to cut this one down. That's the way I approach things. And I didn't really appreciate any of it until it was over. It's interesting that you say that because I kind of felt the same. We're doing this show, and in particular, the, the groundwork has been laid for 18 years, whether it's been in the art business, whether it's been in wrestling art, or whether, you know, whatever it is, um, youth work ministry, whatever, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, and I know in my own self, in doing so many of these interviews so rapidly, uh, that it's difficult sometimes to stop and appreciate, hey, you know, you talk to Eric Bischoff, who was at one time the king of wrestling. Um, in terms of putting it out there, you're talking to Al Snow, you're talking to other guests as well, who I can't mention, but I'll tell you after the show. Um, you know, and it's, I think it's really important. And folks have told me that for years, in, appreciate the journey, because when you get to the end, you may ask yourself, is this all there is? You know, and it's the journey that makes it really, really um, special. Obviously, WCW went on this meteoric rise. Um, and one of the things I found really strange, and Eric, I don't, I, and maybe it's just my own research, but between 98 and 99, just before a major pay-per-view, you were asked to leave the company, if I've got that correct. What on earth went on? Well, it was actually September 10th, 1999. I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> um, this is, you know, th this would require way too much time to explain in su sufficient detail to really give people a, a big yeah. picture. But about 1990, whatever it was, maybe 1996 or 97, Time Warner and Turner merged. Right. And if you've ever been a part of a major corporate merger, you, you one might understand what I'm trying to say here, but whenever you take two major, major corporations, you know, Time Warner had a culture, it yeah. had a personality, it had its own habits, it had its own way of doing things. From the way people dressed to the way they operated in business, to the way they handled finances, they had their own corporate culture. Turner Broadcasting had its own corporate culture. And when you bring two Oh, we've had a freeze. Major companies together, like lived together before to adjust to each other. Okay. And it was, it, it took about a year for the clash of those cultures right. to really manifest in a way that we could start to see them. Okay. They don't happen overnight. It happens yeah. over time. And just as we were getting through the amalgamation or the, the, the marriage, if you will, of those two corporate cultures, in comes AOL yeah. as a, that was going to merge or, or purchase all of them. And that 
created an unbelievable stressful environment for all of Turner Broadcasting, not just for me and WCW. The entire Turner organization was really turned upside down as a result of that attempt, of that merger. And I started to see what was happening okay. and how it was affecting WCW. Right. And I made a mistake, honestly. In my mind, I thought, wait a minute. I have Ted Turner as an, as an yeah. ally and an asset. By that point, I had developed a pretty good relationship <laughs> with Ted. We didn't socialize. He didn't invite me over for dinner, nothing like that. But when it came to business, if it was something I really needed and wanted, yeah. and I was experiencing resistance from people above me, <laughs> but below Ted, hey, Ted. Eric, <laughs> I have a he problem. was your trump card, and and more. Yeah, more often than not, th that worked very well for me. Yeah. As a result of that, I had made several enemies, right, at a very high level above me, but below Ted. Okay. So when AOL came in and Time Warner came in, believe it or not, Ted Turner lost all control of his own company. Wow. I didn't know that. Everybody else did. Uh huh. And I became very combative. I was fighting for my company. I was fighting for what I thought was right. I was fighting for the health and the well-being of this property that I resurrected from the ashes and turned it into the number one wrestling company in the world, arguably. And I felt that I deserved the right to fight for the company that I had grown. And little did I know that there were battles going on above me mm -hmm. And, and there were a lot of people above me that wanted to pull the plug on WCW. They were wow. had been looking for an excuse to pull the plug on WCW since the day Ted Turner launched it. Wow. And now with AOL and Time Warner and this clash of corporate cultures that were going on, uh, it was an opportune time for them to do that. I didn't realize any of that. So I was picking fights with people I should have never picked fights yeah. with cor corporately, <laughs> people above me. Um, and I lost. And they took advantage of that opportunity because Ted was neutralized, mm -hmm. did not have a voice to send me home. And they did so on September 10th, 1999, at 10 wow. o'clock on a Friday morning. What did that do to you emotionally? Because that's, you know, it, it's almost like cutting a mother off from her child. Oh, we may have a little bit of delay. It was tough. Yeah, and I, um, I was in hard because look, it wasn't the creative side of the business that was the hard part. It wasn't dealing with talent. Mm -hmm. It was dealing with internal corporate battles in the politics that were draining me. I was spending 80% of my time fighting things internally right. that I shouldn't have never had to fight, fight about and only spending 20% of my time dealing with the things that I was good at. Ah, right. Um, so by that time, I was pretty drained. Of course. And when when Harvey Schiller, who was my boss, he was mm -hmm. the president of Turner Sports, and I always got along really well with Harvey. I still have a lot of respect for Harvey. Yeah. It wasn't Harvey's decision, by the way. It was made by somebody above Harvey. Right. A lady by the name, I'm pretty sure it was a lady by the name of Vicki Miller. I'm not 100% okay. certain, but Vicki Miller was the head of, of Turner Finance at the time. And she was a member of the executive committee. It was her decision, I think, more than anybody's. And Harvey just, he, unfortunately, Harvey was the one that had to tell me. And, I, I, and, and Harvey told me in his own way. He said, Eric, don't, don't fight this. Just go home and get some rest. Take some time okay. off. We'll talk. It was kind of his way of saying, look, just go along. Yeah. Let me handle this. Let time take care of, take care of it. Just go along. And... At the time, I had my, I was a pilot, mm -hmm. had my instrument rating, had my own airplane, and I was so confused and stunned, okay. I guess. Yeah, of course. Di I mean, directionless. I went from working 18 hours a day, yeah. seven days a week to not having a job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of tough. So I jumped in my plane and I flew out to Wyoming by myself and decided to fly fish for a couple of weeks. Okay. And and try to get my head on straight and get my yeah. feet back underneath underneath me wow i mean that it's it's amazing for and that really explains hopefully a lot more to the viewers as well um 
you know, the fact that you you were devoting so much time and, and it's one of the things that we're experiencing at the moment, whenever you devote something uh, or whenever you devote your time to something other than what's making the money and where your main focus should be, that thing suffers. Um, and that's something that obviously, you, you know, you, you have to go through in some ways. I suppose in some ways you may have answered this in some way, but because I know during this time, Vince Russo comes in and Vince was a, a writer for um, WWE, uh, WWF uh, in the 90s and did, you know, a lot of interesting things. And I, I suppose to, to get a clear picture, what went wrong? And I know you probably, this is one you will have been asked a ton of times, but what went wrong? Where did the wheel start to fall off with WCW? Well, the wheels had been falling off, okay. you know, for quite a while. Again, and, you know, I, I sometimes hesitate to say things like this because it, it sounds like I'm making excuses. But if you go back to early 1998, late 1997, early 1998, WCW was operating on such a high level in, in every way. We were making more money than anybody could, have met, could believe we were actually yeah. making. Our ratings were astronomical. We were getting amazing amounts of positive press in the, in the general media, not the wrestling media, but the general television media. Um, things were going so well. And because of the mergers and the things that I talked about a moment, a few moments ago, they, they meaning corporate, started really cutting, severely cutting budgets. Okay. Even though those budgets had been approved the year before. In the middle of the year, they started dramatically cutting budgets okay. for advertising, from for promotion, from television production, in every way. And at the same time, we were being asked to produce more shows for right. for TBS. So it was kind of a double whammy, if you will. Um, so the wheels had been falling off since about really late '97, early '98. Okay. okay it reached the point that it did with me in September of 99, when I was sent home, they brought in Vince Russo, believing for whatever reason, that he was the guy that could turn things around. That lasted about 90 days yeah. until they realized that they screwed up. They brought in a guy that knew nothing, that misrepresented himself. They bought a bill of goods, mm -hmm. which precipitated them calling me back and the same per people that made the decision to fire me now are asking me to come back. This what was is, that? Yeah. Right. What was your response to that? Was it, do, do I want to do this? Can I trust these people? Can I work with these people? Can I resurrect what they've damaged and done Lord only knows what with? That had to be a lot going through your head at that point. There was, and unfortunately, most of it wasn't good. It yeah. wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. I, which is understandable. I think I was driven more by "I told you so." Yeah, I think I was driven more by "All right, I'm going to prove you, all you people wrong." Mm -hmm. I still didn't fully comprehend what happened to Ted Turner. That yeah, wasn't cool. completely clear to me until some time after this. Mm -hmm. um, so in my in my own way, I believed I could turn it around yeah. and I wanted to do so to rub people's faces in it. And that, that was, that's the wrong motivation, uh -huh. but it, that's what it was. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's honest because, you know, again, when you're fired by any company or when you let go, made redundant, whatever you want to call it, there is a resentment that's there. And especially if it's the people that's calling you back and you're saying, well, you couldn't last without me, you know, there is that. And, and I, I understand that fully. Um, I wanted to ask you, Eric, because this had been, it was a question that was asked to me on a couple of different shows by a, different, a couple of different um, talent and families that were there. You're working with, and you've been in business a long time, of course, and, you know, in WCW, you're working with some of the biggest names around, you know, Bulldog, Sting, Luger, Brett, Hogan, who you know, all went through it at various points in their life, some really horrific um, points in times. Was there any kind of support that was there for the wrestlers maybe that were struggling? No. Okay. No. Simple answer. <laughs> I also want to ask because we, we did have on uh, Georgia Smith and we were talking about the time when Davey had broken his back. Um, 
And, and what was your reaction when, and again, as, as sensitive as possible, I'm completely impartial with regards to this uh, because, you know, it, it's just it, the way that I try and keep myself. But what was your reaction when you told Davies hurt, you know, he may not be able to wrestle for a while. Um, what's kind of going through your head at that point? I want to be very careful how I respond to this. Yeah, because I, I so had to be careful how I asked the question. <laughs> No, but and, and look, I understand it, you know, because yeah. Davy Boy in particular still has a tremendous amount of, uh, of fans around yeah. the world that love him and are petition, part, you know, petitioning to get him in the WWE yeah. Hall of yeah, Fame yeah. and all of that. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to be dismissive, but I have to be honest. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I, obviously, I was disappointed because uh -huh. Davy was an important part of our roster, but Dave, the company was not being built around Davy no. Boy. No, no, no. It, it, Davey Boy was one of a half a dozen wrestlers at his level. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, that's not to diminish Davey's stature. It's only to point out that our roster was so heavy at the time. Yeah. You've got Hulk Hogan, you've mm -hmm. got Sting, you've got Randy Savage, you've got Roddy Piper, you've got Goldberg, you know, you've got Diamond Dallas Page, you've got Lex Luger. That's the, the, <laughs> the top yeah and then you've got another group of very talented people yeah, yeah, below you know. that yeah so while it was devastating to hear it's always devastating to hear that someone is injured yeah and you hope for the best i have to say a couple things one is it's not unusual mm -hmm. those things happen unfortunately in the wrestling industry injuries are just a fact of yeah. life kind of like bad weather mm -hmm. You know it's going to happen. Yeah. You just does. You just hope it doesn't happen at the worst possible yeah. time. So I was disappointed. Clearly, from a business perspective, I was disappointed on a personal level because I've always liked. I always liked Davy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it it wasn't the earth shattering moment that I'm sure it was for Davy or his family. Yeah. Of course. And, and the thing is, I know what we can see, you know, because and, and, and Georgia and I had talked about this on the show. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to have an injury, you know, in a, in a ring that's filled with wood and, and canvas and all that kind of stuff. It's another thing, obviously, when it's a trap door. And it was just unfortunately, it was one of those accidents that, you know, you, you, in some ways you, you, can, you never you never even think of. You never even crushes your mind that that would happen. Um, and um, Obviously, you know, a really difficult thing for, uh, for, 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 I think, for everybody around when they were like, oh, uh, this is, you know, maybe a bit more serious than we, you know, we, we thought on the primarily, uh, primarily level, um, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, I suppose. Um, towards the end, obviously, of the life of WCW, you had made uh, a pitch and you had tried to raise money to buy WCW. You'd got the invested secured. Um, and, you know, you're basically led to believe that this is a surefire thing. You're going to get WCW. Uh, I believe you'd taken some time away, if I remember correctly, and you get a call. Walk us through from this point forward. Yeah, we, you know, I, I had, had found a, a, a group of venture capitalists in New York City that were experienced in media properties mm -hmm. and they expressed an interest in WCW. We agreed to work together to try to acquire WCW. We okay. put together an offer, raised about $67 million uh, in order to, to acquire WCW, entered into a letter of intent and an agreement to do so, uh, went through about 12 months of legal due diligence to make sure that everything that we needed to have organized was organized and, and contracts were in place, uh, that type of thing. It's just common. Um, and we were ready to close within a week or two. And it was in the springtime and my kids were uh, on spring break. Okay. And I realized that if the, when the sale went through, I was going to I was going to be back to working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and may not get a vacation for a couple of years. And that was fine with me. I was looking forward to that. Yeah. So I thought, well, I've got a little bit of downtime here. I'm going to take my kids. I'll let each of them bring a friend and we're going to go to Hawaii for a week. 
and have one kind of final, you know, spring yeah. break vacation with the kids. And it was while I was on vacation in Hawaii, I got the phone call informing me that the deal was done. It wasn't going to wow. happen. It was, wow. it was pretty disappointing. Of course. Because it was announced. It was announced yeah. on Wall Street. We did a Wall Street conference call with the, with the public markets and, and things like that. And I mean, it was, it was a done deal until a gentleman by the name of Jamie Kellner came in he was a, a, a i think he was the new president of turner broadcasting it he had just come in and he looked at the deal and said no i don't want to do it and, wow. killed it. and so, it literally was just yeah, that was simple true. that it was a case of nope i I'm, I'm going elsewhere well part of the deal was that wcw would air on the turner networks and jamie Cullner did not want wrestling on the network whatsoever so that was that was the deal Wow. And, and obviously, I mean, what was going through your head, you know, mind, emotionally, spiritually, everything at that point where you're like, it must have felt literally like someone had gotten a Hoover attached it to you and just sucked all the life out of you. It wasn't that bad. You know, oh, okay. I was just clearly, <laughs> no, I, look, I was still, I had a lot of confidence in myself, Yeah. you know, and, and I, clearly I was disappointed very very disappointed yeah but not devastated i i probably spent that day that i got the phone call i remember it was like 10 o'clock in the morning in hawaii um and that day and probably that evening i was frustrated angry resentful by noon the next day i was like okay what am i gonna do next and I had a completely different point of view. What did you do next? What was the next steps for you? Um, how do I say this without sounding arrogant? I didn't need money yeah. because of yeah, of course, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the way things worked out, money was not my concern. So I began kind of planning my next career. Okay. in television and i was more interested in creating and producing television mm -hmm. uh, not wrestling not 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 in wrestling business so i launched a production company with my partner uh, a gentleman by the name of jason hervey okay and we started our own production company and started producing television shows and and had quite a bit of success doing that as an independent producer in hollywood wow fantastic and and obviously then, you know, within, you know, a couple of years, well, in fact, within a year, if I've got that correct, you end up in WWE. But how does that make sense, Eric? Because you were WWE's arch rival. You were basically Satan's child, according to Vince McMahon. How does all that end up coming to fruition? Uh, well, at some point, Vince McMahon decided he could make money off Satan's child. So he, he, he put in a call. <laughs> to Satan's headquarters, got a hold of the kid, and uh, we had a conversation. And it was a very, it was a great conversation. I knew within, but and by that time, this was about a year later. Now, yeah. By that time, you know, to me, wrestling was my past. Yeah. It just, it was in my rearview mirror. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't resentful anymore. I wasn't angry about anything. I, I just, I looked at it as okay. Well, that was a great experience. I learned a lot. I've built up a pretty good reputation in some parts of Hollywood. I made a lot of money. Um, I'm happy. I'm moving forward with another chapter in my life that I was very excited about and, and having some great success with. So I was, I was a very, um, I was free of any baggage. Okay. That's the best way to put it. That, that I mean, so that's when really Vince called me, you know, when Vince called me, it was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And, and, you know, I, I will say this about Vince, you know, he has his own reputation and, and some of it he deserves and much of it he doesn't, honestly. Yeah. Um, but he was so gracious. He was so real and genuine on that call that it only took me about two minutes where in, in my mind, I'd already made up my mind. I was going to go to work for him. I mean, he didn't know that right away. I did. Yeah. Um, I just, it just felt right. And the offer that eventually I got to work for WWE, that I could still continue producing 
independently producing television wow. shows in Hollywood on my own. So I didn't have to give anything up. It was all added value. All, all, you know, going to work for WWE, all that's going to do is increase my public profile, which is going to make it easier for me in certain cases to accomplish things in, in the world of television. The money was good. It was only one day or two days a week out of my life. And I could still continue to do everything else I was doing. So it was pretty good. I mean, it's and I had fun. You know, what, you know what, John, the other thing I, re I remember thinking, because I, when I went in, you know, after I got on the phone, off the phone with Vince, I went in and, and told Lori, and she said, well, how do you feel about it? And I didn't walk her through all the reasons why I thought it was a good idea. I just said, look, honey, here's an opportunity for me, because my wrestling career at that point was over. Yeah. The, the history book had been written, and it didn't end well no. for me. It wasn't the story I wanted to tell. Yeah. Yeah, But I thought, you know, if nothing else, I get to add a chapter now at the end. Absolutely. And I knew that if I went to work as a talent in WWE, again, not to sound arrogant or conceited, but I'm pretty damn good at what I do on camera. And I knew that working with a bunch of new talent that I'd never worked with before and working on, in, on that WWE platform, which was the largest platform oh, yeah. in the world. And they're so good at so much of what they do. I thought, well, there's no way this is going to end up bad. Yeah. So this will be a way to end, to, to have a final chapter that ends on a positive note instead of a negative note. And that was just about as much of a motivation for me as almost anything else. It is. It's amazing. And, you know, as I found in my own journey as well, you know, interviewing folks like yourself and, and Georgia and Al and, and you know, for, and other people from all walks of life as well, you know, it, it's it's famous by association in some ways. And like you say, you're on that WWE platform, on that WWE, um, you know, radar and things, and your, you know, stock rises, you know, exponentially. Vince is someone that I can imagine interviewing would be picking his brain, although it may never happen, you know, it would just be phenomenal because the mind that Vince is, is just unbelievable. Um, obviously, you know, your, your career there, I last, for 2004, if I've got that correct, was it a little bit after in WWE? No, I think it was 2005. I was still, you know, my contract in it, I think, in 2005. But I was still doing work for them on right. an intermittent basis. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I went to work for Vince, I think, in 2001. Mm -hmm. And I told Lori, I said, this may last a year. Yeah. may last six months, maybe a year, tops. And it lasted five. Yeah. You know, so by, by the end of it, I was, well, be sure I say this correctly. You as, a as a talent, yeah. As a talent, you know when the audience is yeah. getting a little tired of your mm -hmm. act. You yeah. know, it's and and my role as a general manager, as an authority figure, it worked for me initially in WWE because of my history in WCW. Yeah. I brought all that, you know, controversial history with me. In WWE, I was able to play that character in a way that felt very fresh and new to the WWE audience. But as an authority figure, there's a limit to what you can yeah. do creatively yeah. when you're not physically, you know, and I got into the ring a couple of times, but that those were more stunts mm -hmm. and, and storytelling than they were yeah. anything else. There weren't real matches. Nobody expected me to win anything, <laughs> including me. Um, it was just a creative tool to get to the next step. Yeah. But once you've done everything, once you've told every story you can tell from that character's perspective, even as a talent, I was getting bored with it. Yeah. I was yeah. appreciative of it, but there was nothing new for me to sink my teeth into creatively as a performer. Yeah. And I was getting a little tired of it. I knew it was coming to an end. And when Stephanie McMahon called me and said, Hey, Eric, you know, I know you've got some time left on your contract, but we're going to, phase out the general manager thing with you. I was relieved. I yeah. wasn't resentful. I understood it. I would have done the same thing. I was getting bored with myself yeah. as a performer. And, and, I, and I knew that the audience was also getting bored with me. I didn't want that to happen. Yeah. I wanted my, my relationship with WWE to end on a very positive note. And trying to hang on to that role longer than I should have would have conflicted with that goal. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Roddy Piper said it best. I think, you know, get out before they get you out, you know, or leave them wanting more kind of thing. Obviously, you yeah. went on to do, you know, a lot of other things, uh, which, you know, we could spend forever talking about all these different things. But, you know, your time in uh, TNA, your time, obviously, now with your new podcast. Uh, well, <laughs> new, it's been out, what, be about two years now, I think, um, eight to three weeks with Eric Bischoff. 
Um, you know, it, it's it's always interesting, but there's there's been one more chapter that, you know, kind of just, uh, I suppose, to, to bring the, the show to a close. You know, you went back, I believe, earlier on this year for a very brief stopover. What happened? Yeah, I, I was contacted uh, last April or May by WWE, Bruce Pritchard in particular. Okay. And Bruce asked, because we've always been, we've been close friends ever since we first started working together back in 2001. And Bruce asked me, he goes, Eric, you know, would you consider coming on as an executive in WWE? Would you mind if I mentioned your name? I said, absolutely not. Enjoyed my time in WWE. I respected Vince. I enjoyed Vince McMahon. I, I enjoyed working with him. There, there, I love the staff in WWE. The production staff are just the best in the world and had nothing but respect for every one of them. Uh, left WWE on a good note uh, and on good terms. That's good. So I said, sure, Bruce, you know, throw it in. Let's see what happens. And two months later, or a month later, I was sitting in Stanford, Connecticut with Vince McMahon and shook hands and we did a deal. In terms of what happened, you know, um, I think there's a couple things that that were going on. Uh, number one, the, the the position I was being hired for, and Paul Heyman was okay. was he had been hired right before I was interviewed. So the interview as executive director of Raw for Heyman and SmackDown for me, they were brand new roles. Yeah, they had never existed before. It was something that came about as a result of. I think WWE trying to reimagine, I hate that word because everybody uses it, <laughs> but trying to reimagine, you know, how WC or how WWE operated creatively and functionally for television. And, you know, when the, when the role was explained to me, I kind of interpreted it one way, but I think they had a different expectation. I, I think okay. there was a gap between expectation and communication. Um, but at the end of it all, if I had to summarize why it didn't work, I, I think it would come down to my failure okay. to adapt, just right. as we okay. talked about earlier. I didn't adapt to the WWE culture okay. in terms of how things operated. Um, I underestimated my ability to, to adapt. I, I always, I've always thought of myself as someone that really understood it and could adapt to almost any situation. And I think I've gotten to the point in my life where I just wasn't willing to adapt certain things. <laughs> you know, the, and it wasn't that I resisted them. It's just the, the working condition, the, the working culture, okay. not the conditions. The conditions were great. I was flying around on a private jet. I had a nice office. I was making a ton of money. I had all the resources available that I, I needed. Yeah. So it wasn't the conditions, but the culture in WWE was such that it was antithetical to everything that I believe in. Right. And it didn't work for me okay. and it didn't bring out the best in me. Again, it's not like I was resisting it yeah, yeah. or trying to challenge it. It's just, it didn't bring out the best in me. And I think I was disappointed in the, in the culture and the way things were, I think Vince's, Vince's expectations of, of what I was going to be able to contribute were severely diminished as a result. And at the end of it all, I think it was just a chemistry yeah. issue. Yeah. It's just sometime, you know, it's like, it's been a long time since I've dated. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I see dating services and dating apps and it's like, you probably go through these, you go, Oh, wow. This person likes that. And I like that. This person likes this. I love that. And wow, this person's attractive, that person's, oh, let's get together and have dinner. And you get together and you have dinner and you know, five minutes into the dinner, yeah. it's just not going to work. Yeah. It's just chemistry. It's an intangible thing, but it's an important thing nonetheless. And I think the chemistry between Vince and I wasn't what it needed to be. And I take responsibility for that okay. because I should have adapted to their culture. I didn't expect, nor should have expected WWE to adapt mine. <laughs> so that's all. But, but it's, it is one of those things, you know, in every stage of a relationship, there are three stages. There's the, oh, wow, stages you described there. Then there's the reality. And then there's the, can we get beyond this and do business kind of stage? And that's when you really know. And some things just don't work. And it takes a big man to be able to say, you know, 
I hold my hands up here. It, it was my, you know, my mistake, my feelings, my, you know, w- whatever it is, it, it's honest. Um, Eric, couple, final couple of questions. If there's anything that you could look back, if, if there's any point that you look back and you say, if I could have done one or two things differently, is there anything that you look back and say, well, maybe, they, maybe they'd be the ones that I would want to do differently? No, other than what I referred to earlier on in this, this podcast, you know, I, I wish I would have stopped and appreciated yeah. and, and, and been more grateful for the moment in the moment uh, that I, I really wish I could have changed because it would have enhanced a lot of things for me. Yeah. But look, do I wish I was more experienced? Do I wish I would have had 20 years of corporate you know, culture experience under my belt before I took the job? Sure. Was it possible? No. You know, <laughs> do I wish I could have made decisions differently, you know, knowing what I know now, if I would have known it then? Sure. Who doesn't? That's life. But I don't spend 30 seconds thinking about it unless someone asks me about it. And then I usually answer the question in under a minute and move on because I, there's no value in it. You know, what if, I mean, geez, you think about all the things if you would have just done this instead of that, yeah. you know, uh, here's what I tell my kids all the time. Whenever you start doubting yourself or start questioning what you could have done, look, and there's a healthy way to do it. There's always a healthy way to look at, you know, your personal inventory and say, okay, did I handle this correctly? Did I communicate correctly? Did I keep my emotions, you know, in check? Did I analyze things correctly? Did I communicate properly? Did I set my expectations realistically or unrealistically? Those are all things I try to do every day. Yeah. I try to do every day. I don't do them every day, but I try to do them every day. And I tell my kids all the time, you know, it's like, you know, hearing on the news that somebody won 5 million pounds in a lotto game, you know, at a convenience store in Edinburgh, right around the corner from your house. And you say, oh, what if yeah. I would have gone there? What if I would, I should have gone to that store? I mean, it's silly to think that way because you'll just constantly, you know, beat yourself up for decisions you couldn't have possibly have made because you didn't have the tools or the resources or the experience in my case to make them. So I don't, I don't think about it. And I think the whole thing is as well, had you, you know, changed even one thing, you know, you wouldn't be where you are now. And I know people say that all the time, but you wouldn't be where you are right now. Um, you know, and it's, it's been an amazing journey. Do you think there's another go around in, in a, in a form of business or a niche that you want to get involved with? Do you think there's another big go around left in Eric Bischoff? I know there is. I'm not hundred <laughs> percent sure I know what it is, but I know there is, you know, you can always use someone in the art business, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know less about art than I know about music and I'm the most musically uninclined person you'll ever meet. Um, here's for instance, you know, five minutes before I started this podcast, I was on the phone with, um, uh, the writer for a new movie project that I'm working on with Todd Phillips, who was the director for Joker. And um, it, it's a, you may have read about it a while ago. It was kind of leaked to the press, but you know, there's a feature film project that I'm working on for Netflix. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't been greenlit yet. There's nothing I can tell you about it yet, but you know, Chris Hemsworth is attached to it as, as an actor to play Hulk Hogan. And wow. Todd Phillips, I said, is the director of Joker and Scott Silver, who is the writer for Joker, along with Todd Phillips. So, um, yeah, there's some pretty exciting mm-hmm. stuff on my horizon, potentially. And there's some other business opportunities that I'm, you know, looking at pretty closely right now that I'm, I'm excited about. But who knows? Well, all I know is I'm not going to stop. You know, sharks only die when they quit swimming. It's a good way to put it. Uh, You know, are there any times that you look back and you think, you know, those were some, I guess to phrase the question better, what were some of the hardest times that you had to go through and how did it really change you as a person? You know, probably from about 2016 to about 2018 the production company that i started back in 2000 with my partner jason hervey we had to dissolve that um partially because 
the television industry has changed dramatically, yeah. Yeah. dramatically. And it's severely impacted independent producers mm -hmm. such as myself and my former partner. So we went from, again, not to sound arrogant or conceited or anything, but making nearly a million dollars a year to making a fraction of that. Yeah. And, and that's just because the, the television industry has just, as a result of streaming, has just constricted yeah. to the point where I think what you're going to see is streaming becoming the number one mm -hmm. platform for entertainment and yeah. television will be an ancillary piece of I, business. I would agree with that, yeah. You know, up, up until you know the last couple of years, television was the driving force, you know, the driving revenue generator and streaming was an ancillary part of the entertainment business, it's going to completely reverse yeah. probably within the next two years. And the result of that is independent producers such as myself, not just me and my partner, Jason, mm -hmm. but so many independent producers that I know, you know, one of my close friends in the television industry is a gentleman by the name of Tom Beers. Okay. Tom created Deadliest Catch, Ice Road Truckers. He's, he's probably been the most prolific and successful independent television producer in Hollywood for the last 20 years, other than maybe Mark Burnett. Okay. And, and he's right up there with Mark Burnett. Um, I had a conversation with him about a year ago, <clears throat> six months ago. And he said, Eric, if I had to do, if I had to be successful in the television industry today, I couldn't do it. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a man who's made hundreds of millions of, do of dollars in the television industry. Wow. He doesn't think he could survive in today's environment. That's how much things have changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, at this stage in my life, back then I was probably 62. Here I am again, having to reinvent myself. Yeah. I never thought at this stage in my life that I would be in the business of reinventing myself, but that's exactly what I'm doing. And I love it. I'm embracing it. But it was a tough transition. It was really tough. Um, probably the hardest thing I've gone through professionally in my life, including all the crap that went on at WCW. But like it always happens, and my wife, Lori, always tells me it will work out. And then boom, the opportunity to do a feature film. You know, it's one of the most successful directors in Hollywood right now and one of the most successful actors in Hollywood right now or anywhere in the world for that matter. Absolutely. Um, all of a sudden it's right there. And, you know, I guess it's the laws of attraction or whatever you want to call it. But, yeah. um, and now there are other opportunities that are just kind of falling into place. So I don't stress about it anymore. I don't worry about it. I just, I just keep down, I just keep chopping down trees and collecting pop bottle caps. I mean, I found that certainly, you know, people have asked, you know, how did this show start? It actually started from the, the book that I wrote, which you and Laurie, in fact, it, it, there's a copy winging its way to you guys um, called The Battles We All Face. And it talks about all these different battles and struggles that people go through on a day to day level. Really short, really easy to do. As a result of that, we launched Mind, Body and Soul. As a result of that, I messaged Laurie and one other person said, hey, would you mind if I just did an interview where you see where it went? And four weeks later, you know, we're, we're doing this and we've had some of the biggest guests on in, uh, in sports entertainment and it's continuing to grow. Final question I've got for you, Eric, and this may not have been asked before. Is there a spiritual sign to Eric Bischoff? Oh, there is, of course. There always has been. Um, sometimes it's been more prevalent than mm -hmm. others, um, but very much a, a spiritual side of me. You know, I'm... I'm careful about how i communicate it because it's deeply personal yeah i i and, and and you know religion and politics you know the the words that you use yeah. can sometimes mean different things to different people so i'm very careful about how i discuss it but you know i i believe in god i'm a christian but my view of christianity and my relationship with god uh is probably somewhat different than many people's yes yeah. um and but I communicate, think about, contemplate, think about, contemplate is the same thing. But <laughs> I'm aware of my spiritual connection yeah. throughout the day, several times throughout the day, and maintain that relationship. 
keeping short accounts, as they say, and that's fantastic. And it's it is a wonderful place to 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 wrap the show. I think is is there anything that we haven't covered today that you want to touch on, Eric, before we wrap up? Um. <laughs> wow. Most guests I've just had... normally say no, but that what I love about you is, you is you're thinking about it. Is like, is there anything specifically? No, it, nothing really. I, I, I was I was going to make a joke, but I, as I started to tell it in my head, I realized it wasn't very funny. So we'll <laughs> skip that part. Uh, no, I just, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to do, to, to do this show. I really am, along with Lori, looking forward to coming, you know, coming over to the UK, specifically to Scotland Absolutely. and Ireland. Uh, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in Scotland. I've spent a fair amount of time in Ireland. I've spent a little bit of time in Wales. I love it. Uh, I love it. I love the culture. I love the history mm -hmm. more than anything. There's such great history and I, I, I love it. So we, we will be back, as they say. And <laughs> once the COVID-19 situation is somewhat under control and we can do live tours again, I know mm -hmm. I'm talking to a young man by the name of Kenny McIntosh, who's a very successful promoter in the UK uh -huh. and we're going to try to make a live tour in the UK uh, happen as soon as we can. So I'm sure we'll, we'll have a chance to, uh, to chat face to face over a pint or two and maybe some haggis. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, as well, we have actually crossed paths before. And, and, and this just come back in my head at the full of a wrestling event last year in Liverpool. We were actually sitting directly across from you. Um, and uh, I mean, that was just a, a blast and an amazing just thing that it, it, it was as well. Well, wow, Liverpool, that it was the first time I'd ever been to Liverpool. Oh, really? It was, I think I actually love Liverpool. Rose. I love Liverpool. It is, a, it is a great city. There's great architecture. There's old architecture. You know, there's modern architecture. Mm. I had some of the best Indian food I've ever had anywhere in my life. Absolutely. In Liverpool. So, uh, I, I can't wait to. I love Indian food. I love Indian food. It's my favorite food. We've got a curry uh, house I over here called. Probably find... Well, we've got the curry house over here called the Maharani, which we thoroughly love. You guys come over. We'll be happy to take you to York because that's where you get to see old England, um, back where it was in Henry VIII's time and Tudor times and things like that. It's one of the only places that's still actually there. Um, in doing all the stuff throughout through the ages, there's lots of things that you know, and and you, yeah, it's just it's it's amazing. Eric, it has been an absolute pleasure doing this um, extended episode of Mind, Body and Soul podcast with you. It's been brilliant. Is there anything that you want to wrap up with? No, really. I think we've covered it all. I've learned I've learned some things about myself through this interview, so I don't think we can cover it. <laughs> well, and that's always fantastic. Folks, I want to thank you so much for being uh, our wonderful audience. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Don't forget to check out Eric's book. Controversy Creates Cash. There's a link underneath uh, this video where you can check that out. Um, and it supports us a little bit as well um, through our Amazon affiliate links. Check out Eric's uh, podcast if you want to know more about Eric and even go further into this amazing, amazing mind. Um, and it's 83 Weeks uh, with Eric Bischoff. I listen to it every, every single week and I absolutely love it. Um, it's a great thing that I do when I'm painting. I listen to Eric, I listen to Bruce, I listen to Jim and sometimes Jim Cornette, depending what mood that I'm in. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Again, folks, come and check us out at the battles we all face. If you are interested in, in really getting some teaching that's going to help you and be life-changing, this is my brand new book. It's called The Battles We All Face. There's a signed copy going to Eric and Laurie as we speak, and we cover everything from anxiety to trauma to letting go, peace in the middle of the storm, and, and so much more that's there. It's a great book, and we really, really think that this is going to be life-changing for you. We're out of time, folks. I have been your host, John Morris. He has been the wonderful Eric Bischoff. This has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life through inspirational, motivational, educational content. Until next time, take care, God bless, and I'll see you soon.